Welcome to the first session of the conference, the keynote address by Professor Fiona Campbell on the tyranny of low expectations, ableism, education, and advancement. Let me introduce our keynote speaker, Professor Fiona Campbell, to you. She's a professor of disability and ableism studies at the School of Education and Social Work, University of Dundee, UK. She is a scholar and activist activist and undertakes research around ableism, humanization and dehumanization, decolonization and non-Western knowledge as an alternative explanatory frameworks around cultural politics, Sri Lankan disability studies and the self and social relations. Professor Campbell has a long association with the Depart Department of Disability Studies. Um, from its early days when it was the Disability Studies Unit, offering lectures on qualitative research to students undertaking a diploma in speech and language therapy. Since 2007, she has been an adjunct professor in Disability Studies at the Department of Disability Studies, University of Kalania. She's on the editorial board of many highly reputed journals and has highly acclaimed and cited scholarly articles and writings. Her widely read book, Contours of Ableism, attempts to challenge notions of what constitutes normal and pathological bodies and what in particular distinguishes the able body from the disabled body. She is also involved in many community engagement groups, namely the Scottish Women's Association, uh, Women's Autism Network, uh, the Scottish Just Law Center, the National Association of Disabled Staff Networks, Inclusion Scotland, where she is an advisor. I warmly welcome Professor Campbell to address our gathering. Thank you. Over to you, Professor Campbell. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's uh, such a pleasure to be invited to uh, provide the opening keynote to this conference. Uh, it's also a pleasure to be with you virtually uh, here. I mean, this is one of the, the, the good things. Uh, about uh, the virtual environment of opening up uh, participation. Um, so my talk today is going to be a combination of uh, research as well as talking about my own personal experience as a disabled student, as a disabled professor, and also uh, my experience since teaching uh, since 1995 about uh, working with other disabled uh, students. So I hope that you can understand me and, and uh, my accent, and it's very early in the morning here in Scotland, so uh, hopefully uh, things will be clear. One of the things con confronting disabled people is that throughout our lives, we we and throughout our, the life cycle, so from, from the moment we're born, till old age is we are confronted with having to negotiate low expectations. And those low expectations have continued through the decades. I think what is important to remember that depending upon when the disabled person is born or experience their disability, their experiences can differ. So in my case, I became disabled in 1981. So I have lived through a, a series of different approaches to disability. We've had, uh, it's very easy in our frustration to remember that it really has been since 1981, the International Year of Disabled Persons, that there has been considerable global attention uh, on, the, on the matter of disability. Uh, and we've actually come a long way. And I think that's very important to, to recognise because it's very easy to get disillusioned uh, by many of the setbacks and many of the challenges um, that have been raised. 
So let me talk about low expectations. Low expectations are, you know, where it's hard to dream the dream, the fact that disabled people can have a good life uh, and challenge the idea that, uh, you know, the disabled life is somehow compromised, is somehow unwanted, is somehow deficient. Uh, it's important to challenge that, uh, that disabled people can have a good life. In fact, we do have good lives despite our struggles. However, there are limited responsible, uh, responses available for disabled people that many of us and our families have to negotiate. And they are the idea of disabled people being sufferers. And the only way that we can often access support, assistance, and indeed the law is through this paradigm, through this prism of suffering some of us do in fact suffer because of our disabilities, although the social model of disability that some of you may be familiar with also suggests that the cause of our suffering is not so much our impairment, but the way in which society is organised. Um, ableism, which is a negative attitude towards disability, in fact causes suffering. In fact, ableism causes deep seated harms. The other common paradigm or prism to view disability, and it's a paradigm that people can think is positive, is the paradigm of the overcomer. That is to say, and you often hear this, that, um, you know, in the media, for example, that a disabled person may succeed in spite of our disabilities. So this idea of um, separating our disability, that we've overcome our disability uh, uh, as against overcoming and challenging uh, obstacles related to social structure. So this idea of overcoming uh, disability. Um, if you think about this idea and maybe look at another group, for example, we don't speak of um, women overcoming their womanhood in society, you know, uh, being a woman uh, whilst has res often results being second and third and fourth class citizens, particularly as was noted earlier, for example, in Afghanistan, um, we can recognise that disadvantage and that uh, and that suffering, but we don't say that being a woman in and of itself is, is, is a bad thing. So, before I move on, I want to say, particularly for those of you who are thinking, who are at university, young people and, and parents, are, I understand, are in the audience, is to recognise that we do bring our own life experiences. So education about disability actually happens before we get involved in education, if you, if you understand what I mean. So the importance of early childhood life experiences being supportive, uh, uh, having high expectations, encouraging a child to thrive are absolutely critical. One of the other things that uh, disabled uh, students and disabled staff, and you'll notice my talk is directed to both those groups, um, is this idea of, of um, larger buyer, fear, shame, and the idea of being respectable and particularly within Sri Lankan society of, and of not drawing undue attention to oneself um, and one's disability. So there's often a tension there between uh, identifying and uh, claiming one's specific support needs, and yet at the same time, maybe to mask and underplay uh, those needs. All of this situation often leads to what I call internalized negativity. It's very hard that even if we are in a supportive environment uh, as disabled people to not internalize some of the negative baggage about disability, the messages that we receive, whether it be for those of us with visible disabilities of being stared at, uh, comments being made, we might be out in public and uh, people will talk to the able-bodied person and not to ourselves. Uh, 
the idea, for example, within various religious traditions that somehow we are less spiritual, that uh, uh, karma is, is a result, um, our disability is a result of karma. All these things um, can lead to internalized negativity and poor mental health. One of the things I say to my students is that if you don't start out with a mental health condition, depression, as a disabled person, you will surely end up having secondary depression because uh, it's uh, it can be quite stressful and a struggle to um, to to get through and get by in an ab abled world. So the journey is lonely and solitary, and I'm gonna I will come back to that because at the end of the day, you can have supports in place, supportive parents, supportive teachers, but it is you that has to travel that lonely and solitary journey. And uh, how you process that journey is really important in order to be able to complete your studies. Um, I don't know what the statistics are, and this is one area of research that I might just put out to you that needs to be looked at, is the question of ret the, re the retention of disabled students. Once students start at university do they finish their degrees and if they do uh, drop out or it takes longer for example than the average um, uh, degree program what what is behind that so that's a really uh, important area we know in in western countries for example that uh, students undertaking phds which is at the other end of the uh, scholarly journey often it takes a lot longer uh, for students beyond the three to four years normally uh, uh, expected to, um, to complete their PhDs. So these kinds of things need to be looked at. The other uh, area that I, I wanted to talk about, and I will address this in some in later on in my presentation about um, some, some solutions or some strategies, is there is little opportunity for disabled students and staff to talk about their experiences we need to provide opportunities for that to happen. Otherwise, what happens is, firstly, you might end up talking to yourself, which is uh, not necessarily a good thing, but you you internalize that, you know, it's, uh, so the opportunity to talk with other disabled people um, and uh, uh, process what's going on is, again, is important for mental health uh, and not to worry about what uh, people will say. Now, why am I saying this? I'm quite an older person these days. Um, and one of the things, and I would be considered successful, and I'll tell you a little bit about my life journey in a minute, but um, is to say that one of the, again, little research has been done on this, but one of the experiences that has been identified for disabled people who have been successful, successful in life, no matter how you measure it, is this permanent sense of failure. So even like myself now, you know, there's a little kind of a tape recorder in my head, a little voice in my head that often says, you're not good enough, you haven't done enough. So these kinds of uh, feelings are, are really important um, to negotiate. Um, and I, even though I want to be positive in this talk, I think it's important to recognise that uh, many publicly successful disabled people often struggle uh, with talking about some of the, the, the costs and consequences of being the only person, of being the pioneer in their area. And uh, that has resulted in um, mental health issues. Okay, so let me talk, I'm, I wanna move on now in my talk to talk about my own experiences rather briefly, um, because I think, again, the personal is, is political. Uh, I became disabled in 1981. Um, I have an incomplete form of quadriplegia. And um, little did I know at the time, I was only diagnosed 10 years after that, that I also have what's called dyscalculia, which is kind of like a numerical version of um, dyslexia. And I also am autistic as well. Um, so there's uh, 
a combination of disabilities. And in fact, what you will find, in fact, that many disabled people actually have a combination of disabilities and they manifest themselves in different ways, depending on, on the circumstances. Um, when I started out at university, so I was a university student um, before I became disabled and then I became ill. When I returned uh, uh, to good health, the attitude at the time was, this is 1981, as I said, is, and from well-meaning people, we're not talking about uh, nasty people here, but from well-meaning people that, look, we've booked a nursing home bed for you and, um, uh, and a, a, a slot at a sheltered workshop. And I'll explain what a sheltered workshop is if it doesn't make sense in the cultural context. Uh, there was, I was told quite explicitly, there is, uh, I should not expect to go to university. In fact, it was seen to be um, an anathema. So I, that's what I did. I, so my first job, uh, and I still have this in my resume today, is was working at a sheltered workshop, putting lids on bottles, knives and forks in airline bags back in the day when you could have those uh, it, it it and earning 50 cents a day which probably doesn't compute but it was um, hardly any money and that was to be the rest of my life needless to say because I'm a little bit of a troublemaker um, I, I didn't last long in that position and then went and volunteered at a Disability Resource Centre that at the time was run by and for disabled people. Uh, so I was exposed, remember I'm 18, 19, I was exposed to firstly other disabled people with a range of disabilities, a range of age, doing incredible things. So mentoring and role models are absolutely critical I mean, one of the downsides, if I and I say this very carefully, of um, segregated, not having segregated education, of having integration, is that often disabled people have little exposure to other disabled people, other disabled students, you know, people who've gone before them, or indeed being taught by a disabled teacher. Um, so that was a uh, very significant. And at the time, there was no in-house supports at all, which made life very uh, difficult. However, um, I managed over 10 years to undertake my degree. Now that raises an issue in the Sri Lankan context in terms of educational access. For many of us with disabilities, we don't follow the life cycle of the average student. In other words, we don't finish school and then go on to university, you know, 17, 18, 19 years old. Sometimes our early education is disrupted uh, or for a whole range of reasons, uh, we may have to actually go and work, um, to stay out of an institution, to, to support ourselves in terms of personal care needs, and education comes later. So one of the challenges, I think, in the Sri Lankan university system is, is to allow mature age students um, entry into the universities. Um, people, disabled people, will often come to education later. And it's quite difficult in the Sri Lankan context that unless you're 18 or 19 um, and you haven't gone to university and you've missed out to be able to take up educational options. So I'd really like to stress that there needs to be uh, alternative entry uh, to degrees for people in their 20s, 30s, 40s and, and, and onwards. And we know from experience that mature age students, because they don't take integration uh, sorry, education for granted, or often are uh, very committed to their studies and they bring obviously some maturity uh, and some lived experience to the discussions. And I know the younger students uh, actually like that. Education is critical. And one of the things about being asked to speak to you today that uh, thrilled me is I am 
a firm believer in education, enabling us to have freedom as disabled people. Without my experiences of education as a young person and today, I would have nothing. I would not have income security. I would not be uh, exposed to the world of ideas. Education has literally been liberating. Education is a form of emancipation and education hopefully allows us disabled people to get higher wages, which often we need to compensate for the extra costs of disability. Okay, so let me, I'm just gonna move through here in terms of uh, talking about some of the challenges. I think one of the areas that are uh, in terms of advocacy in Sri Lanka is, is getting legal frameworks in place. I mean, legal regulation only goes so far, but it helps. So for example, you though many of you who are working in the area understand the concept of reasonable adjustments. Uh, reasonable adjustments at university, reasonable adjustments in the workplace. And I think we need to get greater clarity on this uh, so that uh, there is protection for disabled students and disabled staff about what is uh, reasonable in terms of making accessible provisions. And I think that uh, that follows on from the, uh, the, uh, the previous comments about having to balance out cost, yeah? Okay, cost and, uh, and, and different kinds of disabilities. But if we haven't got the frameworks um, and those frameworks are, are not being challenged, uh, that presents uh, some real difficulties. One of the issues around institutional ableism in universities, in other words, universities are organised and established according to a, a common understanding about who is the normal citizen, you know, what is the average citizen, what is the average student, what is the average staff member. And because of that, often what universities do is that they, they uh, they push an educational context which uh, uh, very much involves assimilation. What do I mean by that? Often admittance to universities involves fitting into existing norms. Okay, and as I said, and the existing norms are, are based upon this kind of idea of the abled bodied student or staff member, right? And this is not just about disability. It, for example, impacts on uh, women's access to education. It was not that long ago in the scheme of history that women were excluded from education. And in fact, I understand certainly in the UK, that the primary reason, for example, for women's exclusion from medicine was that there were no toilets. So, so, so you know, you, you and and why were there no toilets? Because if you don't have women uh, uh, as students coming into the medical faculty, well, uh, there's no need for a toilet. So it becomes like a vicious circle. So we need to look at this idea of reasonable adjustments uh, because. It sets the parameters, but we also need to educate our, our educational leaders uh, around uh, uh, the, the ideas of disability and what it, and their understanding of what is reasonable. Okay. The, and, and one of the challenges in this area, of course, is, and I think it's universal, but it's also in the Sri Lankan context, is that many disabled people do have difficulties asking for assistance, okay? And that is a challenge. Often we mask our disabilities. Ma what do I mean by masking? We often play down our disabilities. We often minimise them, right? Or we hide them. Um, uh, and even people like myself, I, I experience, for example, uh, chronic pain, uh, but I don't go on about it. And uh, many people are unaware of that. 
So I will do my work at different times of the day, for example. Uh, so this idea and and this idea and of, as I said, we internalize these negative attitudes towards disability. And one word that comes up, and I don't know the word in Singhala, but is this idea of being a burden. We don't want to be a burden. We don't want to be an inconvenience, you know. And I think it's about negotiating that. And when you're working with students in uh in ascertaining what our needs are is, is, is to be clever about maybe students are not telling you the whole story, right? The other thing is students, in fact, may not know what their needs are because they've never been in that environment. And it's only through the process of studying that they uh, realise what their, what their needs are and what, what the issues are. Okay, so I want to talk about uh, institutional ableism now institutional ableism and and um, i should say i don't know whether you'll be able to see it i've got a little book here called um ableism in academia and with this it, there's now work being done looking at the question of institutional ableism in other words what are the structures within universities how they operate uh at all levels that uh result in uh, giving preference to particular kind of people, particularly able-bodied uh, men. Institutional ableism impacts on how universities' timetables work, for example, daily routines, something that uh, you may not think of automatically. What happens to people who have uh, intense care needs and cannot get to a lecture until 10 o'clock, for example? So even how we do our timetabling, uh, the ideas of being productive. Now I'm thinking for disabled staff here. Um, I'm not sure these days, because I haven't been to Sri Lanka for three years, but what kind of pressures are on um, academics. Uh, where I've worked, we have this expression called publish or perish. What does that mean? That means basically you have to produce one to two articles, journal articles, peer reviewed articles each year. Um, so this idea of being productive, what does it mean to be a productive scholar, a productive academic, right? How, how we use our time, for example. Uh, so workplace times and workplace schedules. And the I guess the other thing now is funding cuts with universities everywhere, and particularly as a result of COVID, is this idea of doing more and more uh, uh, work as well. One of the other concepts that uh, uh, is useful to think about, and again, I can, I can provide some links to you on some of these ideas. Um, research has been undertaken on uh, with people who are poor, and I think this uh, can apply to disabled people. And there is this concept of what's called short horizons. What do we mean by that? It, what it, what it, um, Someone's, someone's talking here. Not sure what's happening here. Um, I, I'm not sure who's talking here, and I can't understand what's what's being said. Um, I will just continue. Um, this idea of short horizons. What that refers to is the fact that many disabled people live in a situation of immediate challenges. We live in the now and it's very hard to look forward to the future um, and to plan for the future. Okay, I want to um, just go to the final bit of my talk. I'm not sure how much time I've got left at the moment, but to talk about some opportunities and some solutions for you to think about. I think it's really important, as I've said, to have a have disabled um, a disabled students group. Um, I understand that the, one of the sponsoring centres uh, is a centre related to disabled students, but I actually think it's really, really important for disabled students to organise autonomously, you know, on their own. Um, because we can learn from each other. That's the other thing. So there's some fraternity, there's brotherhood, 
or sisterhood uh, where you can uh, mix with other disabled people but also the reason why I think disabled students groups need to be autonomous, in other words, not part of the institutional structure of the university, is they need to be able to independently feed back information to the university authorities, right? And, and they need to be advocates. So it's very hard to be uh, take on this advocacy role if you're uh, too connected to the uh, immediate institutional body. Um, of course, I mean, universities will have various committees which disabled students can uh, you know be members of but that's a different uh, a different role so i i think that that is really important and uh, can i say it was mentioned in the introduction that um that i uh was involved with the national association of disabled staff networks and one of the and and one of the ideas behind that is uh is that different student groups different staff groups network together so, for example, um, having that set up across all universities in Sri Lanka would be good because some universities are going to be more progressive in this area and others are going to be a little bit of a slow, you know, a, a little bit slow. So it's really important that um, uh, disabled students share their knowledge and experience across the different universities and support each other, uh, particularly in um, with universities that maybe uh, are less committed and um, under under resourced. The other area is um, is is disabled staff networks. Now, one of the challenges with disabled staff um, is getting disabled staff to disclose their disability. Now, again, because I'm a little bit unfamiliar with how this works at Sri Lanka. Um, what happens in the UK is when you sign up to be a staff member, we have what's called equality indicators, equality indicators. So you have to say what, uh, you know, what, what racial group you come from, uh, whether you're male or female, um, and whether you have a disability, right? So that's, and that's just put in for what we call equality um, measurements, equality data. Um, so for example, uh, the Dean of Arts, I think from the University of Colombo talked about uh, the numbers of disabled students. And I must say, uh, I was pretty impressed with that. <laughs> um, but it would be interesting, for example, to do a survey in Sri Lanka with the different universities and to find out how many disabled staff there are. Um, and uh, you know what kind of disabilities uh, they have. So I think um, you know dis the, the disabled staff networks are critical, uh, but there is the challenge of disclosure, right? And uh, I must say, just on a, on a, a, a humorous level, um, is that um, at my university we were running, we, we intended to run a workshop on disclosure and disability. The disabled staff network was going to run this workshop we didn't go ahead because we couldn't get any volunteers <laughs> in other words there were many disabled staff who were happy to say yeah i'm disabled and in, within our group but they would not come out publicly yeah and um and say that they and say they were disabled so so that that was the irony many people have uh a fear that disclosing their disability will affect their career pathways. Um, and that certainly is my experience. Even in my school, um, I'm one of the few that has disclosed a disability. I mean, I use a wheelchair, so it's not that hard, it's not that easy to hide it, but they um, but I've also been very public, for example, about being autistic, which you can kind of hide. But there's probably about five staff in my school who have disabilities but they are not very public about it because people are um, fearful that it will affect their career pathways so we need to look at this um, I don't think that it is necessarily a fear that is unwarranted um, particularly for staff with mental health issues there's lots of um, stigma around that or uh, staff with learning uh, disabilities. So um, disabled staff networks, that would be something that's worthwhile having a look at, because the other issue is 
role models and mentors. I think it would be brilliant to have, you know, for disabled students to have a disabled staff member who's at, who's out, um, who can be a leader. Um, just like in the days when there were very few women lecturers or professors and how important and fundamental that was. To see somebody that they may have a disability different from your own, but to see somebody in that situation can be extraordinarily uh, powerful. Um, I've only got about three minutes left, so I want to keep going through this fairly quickly. The other area that is worth considering, and this can be run and this can be hosted by the, the, the three centres here, um, is what we call consciousness raising groups. Uh, that was a concept that took place in the 1970s among women and women feminism. Um, consciousness raising groups are there for disabled people to gather and explore and discuss their lived experiences. Um, often we think, when we've experienced something, it's just happened to us alone, you know? And then we suddenly realize, hang on, there's a common commonality of experience here. So consciousness raising is really important because people, disabled people are at different stages in understanding their disabilities and accepting their disabilities and indeed celebrating their disabilities. So that's, uh, again, another strategy that can uh, take place. Um, the, the, I've already made reference to mentoring. I think it would be really good and useful and particularly in terms of retention. So making sure that disabled students, uh, you know, complete their degrees of having a buddy, a buddy system where they can be assigned mentors um, throughout their university life, but actually beyond that, because obviously mentoring of disabled people in the workplace uh, is critical. The finals, and, and I want to say two more things before I finish. Um, again, it was great to hear of the University of Colombo having a special intake. I would like to know more about that. Um, I, I, I do think, and I've already mentioned it, I do think we have to think of alternative entry. Sometimes people have fears about that, that alternative entry means having students who are not equipped for university life. Uh, we ran about 15 years ago when I was in Australia, a alternative entry scheme. And actually many of the students uh, were older, as I've mentioned, uh, they didn't have a previous degree but they worked hard and they were successful. So I think alternative entry um, is a really important uh, point. Finally, but not least, now I'm a researcher by heart. I'm absolutely uh, committed to research. One thing, I mean, the war is over. I know things aren't perfect, but one of the things I always wanted to look forward to in Sri Lanka is more research around cultural constructions of disability. We need, given Sri Lanka is a religiously orientated society, we need research looking at, for example, Hindu beliefs and ethics and practices around disability. We need research on Buddhist approaches to disability. We also need to look at how disability is understood in different localities and in different cultures within Sri Lanka. Are there regional uh, differences? You know, this is really important because unfortunately, a lot of the understandings of disability in disability studies that students are exposed to are often based on Western understandings of disability. So we need to, to have research that looks at how this plays out, right? Um, and it's really critical uh, to work on this. And I'll just give you a little example, less controversial because it's not Sri Lanka. Um, uh, I was looking at uh, disability in North Korea um, 
And one of the things I found out was that for some reason, and I don't know the answer to this, but for some reason, uh, dwarfism or short stature was highly stigmatized, right? So one of the things would be to, to use that example is to look at where do those attitudes come from? What cultural beliefs impact upon that? So I would really, for, particularly for those of you who are anthropologists and sociologists out there, to actually, we need to do work on, on the cultural constructions of disability in Sri Lanka. And I know that work is very um, uh, much progressed, for example, in the, in the Indian context. Um, so I'm probably going to, um, to, to, to leave it there at this stage, but to say that, you know, by having a greater presence of disabled students, that's good for the non-disabled students. By having more disabled staff, as I said, that's good for disabled students, but it's also good for all students. Um, you know, I know when I teach today, and I, I, I uh, not that I've been doing face-to-face -face teaching, but when I come to the class in the wheelchair, um, some students get quite shocked. They've never uh, been exposed to someone in a wheelchair, let alone uh, being taught by a person in a wheelchair, let alone having a professor in a wheelchair. So um, uh, all these things are really critical. So thank you very much. I'm happy to, um, you know, take questions and discuss anything and everything. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Campbell, for your enriching talk on institutional uh, ableism in education and uh, strategies that can be developed to support the admission and retention of disabled students. It's, uh, it was really um, enriching. And also, um, you mentioned a few uh, research areas we can explore, which are the cultural, um, or I would uh, say decolonization methods using those uh, into a uh, uh, context. Um, and thank you very much for joining us early morning uh, from there. Uh, we really appreciate uh, your support. Um, as uh, we are short on time, I will uh, just direct uh, one or two questions to you. Uh, I would like to ask you what policies could be adopted by universities um, to encourage more students uh, with disabilities to enroll. I, well, I think, um, you know, a, firstly, a commitment to inclusion, you know, and, and that certainly has been uh, certainly stressed by the earlier speakers. Um, we have, uh, and this comes back to law, in, in, in the UK, we have this concept called anticipated reasonable adjustment. In other words, we don't wait for a disabled student or a disabled staff member to come along. We look at what can we do to make diversity a reality? How can we uh, make this environment uh, welcoming for all. So what? So so we 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 do that, you know, because sometimes what happens is universities will say, "Oh, we haven't, you know, modified this classroom because we don't have the disabled. We've never had a disabled student, yeah." <laughs> But it's a chicken and egg, isn't it? So I think um, I think the having having that policy uh, when we're talking about equalities, mentioning disabled uh, students and staff, um, looking at uh, admissions criteria, and uh, as I said, hiring criteria uh, as well. That that is a start. Um, I would also be lobbying. Um, and I know that this has happened over many, many years in Sri Lanka, and it's a slow process, but for anti-discrimination legislation, because it needs to have the force of law, right? Needs to have the force of law so that these ideas can be enforced and that universities do the right thing. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a question uh, from Kasunjit. Please direct your question. Uh, so just for, uh, I really liked your presentation. Having uh, studied in a both in a Sri Lankan school uh, as a disabled person uh, uh, with an inclusive uh, study environment, and as a 
person who has studied in uh, a UK based university and uh, with the uh, inclusive facilities and, uh, and uh, I'm a person with cerebral palsy who's, uh, who has uh, studied law at uh, the UK. So basically just wanted to ask you how, how should we look at uh, establishing disability support centers or uh, as uh, st study planning for uh, a guy, uh, guy, guide and planning for disabled people to support uh, inclusive education in terms of university environment in Sri Lanka because I feel like that is one of the most uh, uh, overlooked areas in terms of reasonable accommodation in the local system when it comes to this, uh, the university system. So basically just wanted to get your idea on that. Well, I think this conference is a start. The fact that you've got three research centres collaborating is uh, is fantastic. And, um, you know, I would suggest a national uh, network be established, not just um, a, a conference, that maybe one of the outcomes of this conference is a commitment to establish a, a formal organisation. Uh, one of the things about the pandemic is it, uh, I mean, and it's, you know, it's obviously a horrible situation, but one of the things that we've found is the use of technology. I mean, I have been involved in the most extraordinary networking, you know, with lots of different countries and people. There is no reason why we can't have a nationwide network uh, of people working in these areas to develop a strategy, to produce policy documents, and to be an advocacy organisation. And that we that, that this one of the outcomes of this conference is that, that every university in Sri Lanka is invited to join this network. Uh, so thank you. And it's not perfect. We have to. Can I say? Um, I mean, my university, uh, you know is good in some areas and not so good in other areas. So one of the, the strengths of a network like this is for uh, different institutions to support each other um, and to, um, you know, combine. Uh, numbers make a difference uh, in terms of lobbying and advocacy. Thank you very much, uh, Prof Campbell. Uh, I think as we are tight on uh, time, uh, and since we need to start our next session at uh, 10.40, that is, uh, I think we have a minute uh, for the next session. Um, we will be sure to get back to you with any other questions. I hope that's all right with you. And yes, that's, that, that's, that, I was just going to say, that's fine. And, you know, uh, God willing, in terms of the COVID uh, pandemic, I'm hoping to come to Sri Lanka uh, next year to see you all. Um, it's been a, a little while, so um, I will uh, let you know um, when I'm coming and, um, you know, uh, and you, to use it as an opportunity. But uh, I wish you luck for the rest of the conference. Thank you very much, Prof. Campbell. That is really uh, good news. Uh, to see you in Sri Lanka quite soon. Thank you very much, everyone.